When I think about how God, there's nothing that can defeat my God. There's no germ. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no lack. There's nothing. There's no problems in a home. There's no relationships that can't be resolved. Are you with me? I mean, come on. There's nothing impossible with God. And so when I think about it in that realm, then I, I, and I begin there, God, I want to have that dominion power, that dominion that Adam had before the fall, that dominion that the Lord Jesus Christ came and, and exemplified. He showed us what it's like. I love it in the Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about that Jesus was the express image of God's person. And what does that mean? That means that's the example that's what, you know, people all the time are trying to figure out what, what does Christianity look like today? What is God looking for out of this term we call Christianity? Well, it's more Christ-like, amen? It's becoming more like him, not, not just, just admiring him because we do. I mean, there's no greater person in the world that I've ever met than my Lord and Savior. But, but the point is, he didn't come here just to impress us. He came here to be an example for us, Amen. And we're going to see that in some of the verses that we read today. And so if you would, in the Hebrew, uh, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 8, let's talk about a little bit more about who's your daddy. I remember one time, before I read that verse, I got to tell you this. I remember one time when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the gathering that he had at that time. And I remember Jesus saying these words. He says, you are of your father, the devil. Man, I would never want to be in that category, amen? So that tells us right there that there's two spiritual beings that want to be our daddy. There's only one that I want. And because you're in church today, I know that's the one you want. But what we've got to do is get God to give us revelation on how we can get to that place where the relationship is so intimate, so, so, so valid that we can call him daddy, amen? We have to understand daddy, And we have to understand his ways of doing things. So in Romans chapter 8, I'm going to start in verse 14 to launch this message today. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And we talked about how that word Abba from the, from the Greek word abbas, which means daddy, all right? It's, a, it's a, a closer relationship. And the spirit himself, itself, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together also with him. Now, notice the transition there, just a couple of verses. First of all, he talks about sons of God. Then he talks about children of God. Well, children is a, is a word in the Greek that's used for a young person, a young, growing person who has consciousness, is, is growing to that place where, you know, how many of you know that, that when a child begins to get understanding of his surroundings, they begin to do things that, uh, you know, that they have to be taught different, amen? How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, children are going to test authority. They're going to test their own will. They're going to do things because they're immature, right? And we don't discard them because they're immature. We teach them. We help them to grow, right? But there's this word sons, huios in the Greek. And and the word huios means a mature child. Someone, one that is still a child, but yet maturing. Are you with me? Paul used these words very, very strategically as he presented this message that, that we are to grow into a place of maturity. Now that belongs to all of us. Amen. And so, when we see his, his opening remark that starts out in verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit. Now, this message is to the body. It's, it's not to anyone in particular. Uh, the word sons is, is not gender sensitive. In other words, it doesn't apply just to the male. It applies to all of us. Amen? We all mature. But in, in this context, you know, sons or maturity, that's what he's describing we all want to come to that place of mature believing where we are functional and living God's dream. Amen? That's his desire for us. So what I want to say is, you know, you may never be called into a full-time ministry position. You may never lay hands on the sick. You may never 
do something, you know, be in the spotlight, so to speak. I mean, that seems to be a very common thing nowadays. I, I, wanna, I want the spotlight. Well, you know, that's not something we should want, right? That's immaturity. But, but what we should want is, a, is that walk with God whereby we mature. So it's not about will I ever do this or that? Will I ever be uh, in full-time ministry? That should never be a goal, all right? And so, but what we are called is to live the dream, all right? Every one of us has a purpose and a plan. Every one of us has a design purpose that, you understand, it, it could be living the dream on your job. It could be living the dream in your home as a dad, as a mom, as a husband, as a wife. It could be living the dream as, as a, a, a banker, a lawyer. I don't know. But what I'm saying is God can be involved with that process. To make it the very best it can be to be an example that there is a God. We don't have to sell out to the world. Come on now. We don't have to play their game. We can be a believer out there in the world and an example that God is working in this. You can be the best that you can be. Amen? That's the dream. I mean, it doesn't matter what phase. And so, you know, this is not something about, you know, well, he's only talking about leadership or he's only talking about this. No, we're talking to every believer, that God wants us to get to the place where we're led by his spirit. Now, we're going to talk today about kind of some of the things that, that matter as far as that's concerned. I believe that God has victory in your, in your future for every one of you, for every one of us. I believe that God has a life of blessing against any and all adversary. But we're going to have to learn how to be led by the spirit of God. And this is what the Lord put in our heart about three weeks ago concerning, he said, this is one thing that is of utmost importance. We're getting to, we're in the fifth month of 2015. We're approaching the halfway mark, amen? And so if it's what we're doing, what we're understanding, what we're learning is going to help us live the dream. And so the Lord said, this is one of the most important parts of it is that learning as many as are led by the Spirit of God, where we begin to understand the relationship where God is our daddy. Amen? Not impersonal, but daddy makes it more personal. Amen? Not just a father, my father. Not just a dad, my dad. Amen? How many of you remember growing up, whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter, how many of you remember when you began to understand the relationship of dad? Well, he was not just a man that was, that was responsible for bringing you into this world with your mom, but, but now he becomes that, that person in your life where you're dependent, not, not dependent upon him like a baby would be, but you're dependent upon him as a father and son or a father and daughter. Amen? It becomes a very important relationship, very close relationship. And so this is what Paul is describing here that God wants us to do. Now, first of all, we see as many... As are led. So bring the first slide up. For as many gives us the understanding that the will of man is involved with the outcome. See, he didn't say everyone. He said, for as many as choose. In other words, there's an element of choice here. How many of you understand that? I have to choose that I want this relationship. I don't want to just live my life the way I want to live it and then one day go up into heaven. There's a lot of lives that are lived like that. But there are those that have a yearning, something on the inside. They're facing things in life and they're wanting that closer walk with the Lord. Amen. They're realizing that, man, I, I know how to pray. All of us know how to pray. All of us know how to come to God and ask him for things. All of us know how to, to realize when we get in a tough spot, hey, this is bigger than me. So I need God. Well, what God wants to do when we get in those places is learn how daddy would respond to a mature child of God. All right. So the element of of choice is seen as many. That's why it's presented like that for as many. What that means is not everybody's going to want this. Not everybody in this room today is going to want this. Not everybody. And so what happens is we develop this characteristic of a spoiled child. Well, we understand the the value of God. We understand the power and the presence of God. But what we want is God to fulfill my will. That's immaturity. What we want is God to, you know, if I get in a bind, God, now I'm going to call on you. Where our faith is kind of like I, I describe it from time to time, like that little fire 
that little, that little firebox on the wall right there, or, or, you know, you've seen those where they have the glass and they have a, a fire extinguisher behind it and an axe and a hose. You know, it's like, in case a fire break this glass. You know, in case I get in trouble, I'm, I'm going to look at my faith and say, okay, in case I need it, I'm going to break this glass. No, the mature believer learns to live by God's word every day. All right, so, so this, takes, this also means that there's going to be a process. A process. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, that, that's just a process indicator is all that is. And so this gives us that understanding that I have to make decisions if I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, if it's too tough and it's too much more than I can bear, it's okay. All right? It's okay. There's therefore now no condemnation. You know, just live, just live for God and live for Jesus. But you understand, you may need a little help when it comes to being led by the Spirit of God. Now, led by the Spirit is the position of the mature believer in the process of restoration and victory. So whenever it comes to the place where my life, where I need something from God, we, we have to not just rely on doctrine. We have to rely on the Spirit of God to help us. Now watch. How many of you know that, that one, of the, one of the things in the armor of God, you know, if you're in a battle... Now, if you're not battling anything, you know, then the armor is not important. But if you're in a battle, how many of you know the armor of God is necessary? What does it begin with? Truth. Everything is revolving. Everything is hinged upon knowing the truth. Righteousness is when I apply that truth, when I accept that truth above all of my own thinking, all of my own discern, anything like that. But that truth is what's most important. Then I apply that by by believing it. And so it talked about Abraham, how that whenever he was growing in this relationship with God, a man of faith, we saw that 25 years, he he beheld God's plan. And and listen, he made mistakes. He did those things in immaturity. But in the end, come on now, he learned some things. He learned how to get from where he was to where God wanted him to be. He learned how to get to that place of victory. All right. But 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 the position of this mature believer, you understand, if I'm in a battle, truth is necessary. Do I know the truth about what I'm going through? Do I believe that truth? Now, when you say you believe it, now I've got to be led. And when you're being led, you've got to have peace. That's the next piece of armor. You got to rely on that peace. God leads us in the pathway of peace. Can you say amen? Never, never struggling against it, never trying to figure out, but a very well-defined path. We're going to talk about that at the end of this message. And then that place of faith, where I know the truth about every fiery dart the enemy releases from his bow. See, you have, that's what faith does. If, If the enemy throws a thought in my mind, I know it is written. If the enemy puts a physical problem, ailment, I know what's written. If the enemy makes me look at a problem and start to worry, I know what's written. Are you getting the, the flow of it? Understand? Those things are very basic. All right? And then you have salvation. The covering of salvation. That's the covenant walk with God. And then you have the sword of the Spirit. Now, if you looked up that, this is, this is so important to be led by the Spirit of God. I have, to, I have to understand a couple of things. Like the sword of the Spirit is... The word of God. That word is rhema. The spoken word. By the spirit. How many of you understand what I'm telling you right now? Not by the doctrine, but but my God, uh, because I know the truth. He's going to give me the words to speak when I need to speak. He's going to combat the enemy whenever I need the victory. Are you with me? But when I start spouting out doctrine and eight steps on how to do this and seven steps on how to do that. You understand when I run out of that, I better have some spirit. (laughs) Come on now. This is what we're talking about. Learning how to apply these great principles so we can be led by the Spirit of God. Because if we want to be that, and I'm going to make the assumption everyone here is on board with that. They would like to be. Amen. And so we have to understand the next thing he said there. As many as led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. You've not received the spirit of a bondage again under fear, but received the spirit of adoption. Now notice You've received the spirit of adoption. Last slide I have up here. 
The spirit of adoption is when a believer comes into the revelation of the relationship that we received upon accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord. It's a growth process. Notice he said, you haven't received adoption. You have received the spirit of adoption. That gives us the indication that there is a process that began. And that God, because it's a capital, capitalized S, as you can see, that God is involved with the process. He becomes the teacher. Are you with me? And he has a goal. And that goal is called adoption. Now, we're going to look at that in Galatians 4 in a moment. But when we begin to mature in an area of our lives and we begin to mature in that place, church, this is what happens. Then we begin to be, we become those that are adopted. All right. Now, this can come by the process of elimination where, you know, it's not all at once, but I have to learn. I have to learn how to be a good steward over things that are important. My spirit, man. My soul, my body, come on now, my finances, my marriage, my home, those things that apply. We begin to learn systematically, come on, how to be mature in those areas. You understand? It's not just like court blanche all of a sudden, well, okay, I'm saved now. God's going to take care of everything. No, you, you see, that's a misconception that we've had and the misconception that, okay, I'm just going to tell God, you know, by faith, God, you got to do this. You know why? Because your word says, God, so you, you're obligated to do this. No, you, you have to understand, that's not Daddy. Daddy already wants to do that. But he needs us to be on board with that and take us through the process so that we'll mature in those areas, each and every one. Are you with me now? So we come to church, and what we want to learn is not just spiritual doctrine. We want to learn how to be led by the Spirit of God. We learn the principles so that when it's needed, God can share that with us. Notice he said, you have received the Spirit who is going through the process of adoption. Now, I want to say this. I told him on Wednesday night when we opened up this process, opened up this message, the process of adoption Who can I look to as a biblical example of what this process looked like? Is there anybody? Well, I'll tell you the one that's the main one. His name is Jesus Christ. How many of you understand that Jesus did not one miracle until he was 30 years of age? Why is that? You see, Paul understood this was something, when we read the Bible, we have to understand the culture of the Bible. What, was, what does that mean? What, is the, what, is, what process are you talking about, Pastor? Well, Jesus being the example of the mature son, come on now. How many of you saw that Jesus never bowed his knee to any adversity? And so I began to look at that when I learned this years ago. I said, Lord, I need to learn how to function like that all right because christ dwells in me how many of you know that christ dwells in your spirit when you're born again well that's the point that you receive the spirit of adoption now the process begins jesus like every other hebrew child now listen here's the process we're going to get to when god says okay you have proven the relationship You have stood the test. You have performed properly by faith. Like every other Hebrew child, I'm going to take Jesus as the example. Every one of them went through this. On the day that they were born, all right, until eight days old. At eight days old, something very strategic, something very important happens in a child child born as, as a Jew. At eight days old, they are circumcised. The male child is circumcised. Blood is shed, covenant is made, you understand, according to law, and they're given their proper name. Are you with me? At eight days old. Now, that child doesn't know that yet, all right? And then at three years old, I'm just going to move through the process quickly. At three years of age, he's given what we would call a baptistry robe. It's a tzitzi is what it's called. It's a little white robe, and it's got little tassels on it. And it's really, you know, it's really nice. All right. And at three years old, he's given that. There's a, there's a maturing. You understand? He's still a child. 
He's under tutors and governors. He's under authority. Now, up until that point, mom has been teaching him the way, the way in like a homeschool, if you will. And also including in the most important class, and that is, of course, the Torah. The teaching of the law, the teaching of the word of God. Are you with me? So from three years old till eight years old, that's what's happening in the home. At eight years of age, every child, including Jesus, now is going to work with dad. Up until noon that day, he's homeschooled by mom. At, and at afternoon, he goes, dad comes home for lunch, and dad now takes this young son, young son, eight years old, and they go to work together. And he begins to learn the family business. Everybody say the family business. All right, so these words are going to come up here shortly in Jesus' life. You didn't know all this was going on, but it's going on. And so he's learning the family business. At 12 years old, he does his bar mitzvah. Girls do the bat mitzvah, okay? The, the process is going on. And so the maturing, learning the family business, 12 years old. Now he's going to give his rite of passage. Now he's 12 years old, and he goes in front of the elders, and he began to bombard him with the scripture, Right? How many of you remember when Jesus was 12 years old, we have a record in the scripture of what took place that day. The family had come to Jerusalem. They'd come to pay their taxes. Now they're on the way home. And lo and behold, where is Jesus? How many of you remember? Where was Jesus? Okay, you understand he's in the process of adoption. He's not done not one miracle, although he is the son of God. He's not done one miracle, although he is the Christ. Although he is everything God destined him to be, he is already. However, nothing has happened. Do you understand? This is why those things are recorded in Scripture. Not just for us to have a little, a little wonder, you know, isn't that neat? Oh, wow, you know, and we get impressed with all that. Then his mom comes back. Mom comes looking for him. She finds him in the temple in front of the elders. Now, it doesn't record everything that was said, but I'm sure mom was going, what are you doing here? Wasn't that what you would do, mom? Why hadn't you, you know, why do I have to come looking for you? I don't know what was said, but what did Jesus say? Huh. Everybody say the process. There was a transition right there. Mary is the only person that really wholeheartedly knew who the father of this man, this boy, this man Jesus was. Are you with me? You understand, when they gave him his name at eight days old, it wasn't Jesus Christ. Chew on that for a minute. It was Jesus. That name has a meaning. But he wasn't given the name Jesus Christ. Nobody knew he was a Christ. He was in process like every other Hebrew, Jewish, Jewish child. From 12 years old till 30 years old, we hear nothing about this man. Why is that? Because the next step is going to define whether he has been accepted or not. 18 years of silence. What do you suppose was happening during that 18 years? Do you think that, that he was gaining special advantage? He did no miracles. Although now he is 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on. Right on through the pages of time. No miracles. Nothing done. Why? Adoption. Is he being led by the Spirit? Do you think that if Jesus encountered a school ground fight that he was going to do the right thing? If he didn't, come on somebody. No. See, we have to understand the, the value of how important it is that he be our Messiah. That he be our Lord. We have to understand that in those 18 years he encountered, how many think he encountered things that are difficult in the human life? I mean, the Bible says, you know, we just look at that verse and we just assume that, you know, well, it's because he's Jesus. You understand, he faced things yet without sin. He was touched with every weakness we have. 
Weaknesses of thought, weaknesses of, of what to do when this happens, weakness of obeying your parents or not. Come on now. Everything. At 30 years old, the time designated if you're going to be in the priesthood, the time designated by the Father who gave the law. That time at 30 years old, Jesus comes walking down the bank of the Jordan River. How many of you believe that everybody has been aware of this man? But nobody knew him as the Christ. Nobody knew him as anointed. Nobody knew him as mature. He's just Jesus. He walks up to John. And John, looking up and he says, he steps up now in the... In the process here, the people are being baptized. Now, I told him in that Wednesday night service, can you imagine if you were standing? Now, how many of you know what John's baptism was? The baptism of repentance, right? So if you grew up Catholic as I did, and you had to stand in line to go in that little scary box and talk to the man behind the sliding wood door that you can't see him when he opened it, you just, you just have to confess this. I mean, that was scary for a little kid, Now I'm going to tell you. But if you were in that line waiting to go for your turn and you're a little bit older now and, and man, there you are and the guy in front of you turns around and he goes, hey, I never met you, I'm Jesus. <laughs> now see, to us now, that would be very strange. That here he is walking down into the water, waiting on his turn. John the Baptist looks up and he goes, whoa. And Jesus said, I need to be baptized with you. And he says, wait, you need to baptize me. Jesus said, no, no. Allow it to be so now to fulfill all righteousness. He became, even though he had no sin of his own, he became fully human at that moment. Come on now. Come on. <clears throat> the process. And he goes down under the water and he comes up and a voice. The Holy Spirit now lights upon him. What did the voice say? Adoption. It was at that moment that the father said, now, this is my son. Now, why is that important? Because every child goes through that. And when they would come to the city gate and all the place where people were gathered, then that, that dad that had now been raising his son and has taught his son the family business, now that son is going to be ready to go out and participate as a, an ambassador of the father's business. And the father would, by saying that, would say, what he says, I say. What he does, I'm doing. There is no separation. I'm daddy. Come on now. Jesus comes up and the father God now, his father, in front of all of those witnesses says, this is my son. Well, how would I know that? That's when the miracle ministry began. That's when the dominion, that's when the miraculous started happening. Why? Because he is now, quali he is led by the spirit. He is the example of what it is, the father you can't see, his words. Now, how many of you understand we don't have any words recorded of Jesus for all of those years? Oh, come on now. But when he was announced that this is my son in whom I am well pleased, I approve, and it's now time for you to recognize he's about to do my business. Every word you have in read in your Bible were recorded from that moment on. Are you with me? The first words he said was, the kingdom of heaven is within reach now. What does it look like? Oh, to the sick, it was wellness. To the poor and impoverished, it was provision. To those that lacked in any moment of time, it was provision. To those that needed wisdom, it was wise. To those that didn't understand the value of sin and bring an adulterous woman and lay him at his feet and him kneel, kneel down the sand and write words, we'll have to wait to get to heaven to find out. But then he says, go and sin no more. Where are your accusers? What was he saying? He was saying, whatever he wrote in the sand, they walked away one by one. Perhaps they were seeing their own sin and knowing the law. Realizing after we stone her, I'm next. And I don't want to be stoned. Come on, do you understand the maturity here? 
of not condemning people, but being led by the Spirit. Come on, he is our example, man. That's what adoption looks like. That's when it was fully known. Daddy has approved. Are you saying, preacher, that we can get to that point if you want to? Because when you're led by the Spirit of God, your words have impact. Not just quoting a memorized scripture, but it's of the Spirit of God. It's something that God put in your heart. And when he told you to say it, honey, there's one thing you better know. Something about to change. I said something's about to change. Something's about to take place that people are going to take up and can't help but take note. Why? Because God the Father has put these words in a human being and that human being was led by the Father and has been approved not full of religion and legalism but of the Spirit of God. Do you think Jesus tested patience during that 18 years? Do you think Jesus tested long-suffering and love and joy and peace? Do you think Jesus was developing all those characteristics that we know now are the fruit of the Spirit? But we have about that much patience and so much confidence in our own self. And we want the anointing and it will not be there. And I'm here to tell you, you can put on the show, you can put on the glitz and glamour. But what I'm about to tell you is this. Let me tell you something. Without the anointing of God, it don't mean nothing. You can have a church full. Come on. Our job as pastors is to get maturity. Now watch. Galatians chapter 4. Bring those verses up. Got two more verses to look at. Well, two more sections. Now, this is right after Galatians 3 in the last verse, 29. That if you're a child of Abraham, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, Paul says right after that. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child. How many of you remember what a child is? Growing, a child of God, born again, a believer, come on now, that is either going to grow up under training or not. As long, how many of you understand when you got born again, God says it's all yours? You have to understand these are covenant words. These are words where God says, listen, it's available. You're an heir. You belong to Jesus. You saw that in Romans chapter 8. You're an heir of Jesus Christ, a joint heir. What is a joint heir? It means the same. Come on now. If he had it, it's yours. If he did it, it's for you. But remember, he went through the process. The heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord, ruler of all. All what? All the circumstances that come my way in life? All the things that are detrimental to my growth. Come on now. To my witness. Come on. Verse 2. But even though he's Lord of all, even though he is an heir, he's under tutors and governors. You understand? Everybody say under authority. Now look at this. How many of you understand? This is repeating what I just told you about Jesus. Come on now. He went to church. He grew and matured. How many of you understand that that this process he was doing, he was under tutors and governors until what? Hmm. See, we have to learn the process. The process. How many of you understand that Jesus' teachings were strictly enforced by Connecting the spirit and the natural. All the way back to Genesis chapter 8 verse 22. As long as the earth remains there will be seed time and harvest. And what was one of the first parables he taught? About seed to harvest. All right. Everything he taught he was under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Verse 3. Even so when we were children. We were in bondage under the elements of the principles of the world. You understand a child of God. Is, is not exempt from the things that are in the world. Are you with me? I mean, the curse is in the world and all of the effect thereof. 
There are things out there. They're dangerous to your flesh. They're dangerous to your health. They're dangerous to your mind. They're dangerous to your life. They're dangerous to your marriage. Are you with me? They're dangerous to your children. They're dangerous to those things. Right? You're not exempt from them just because you're a believer. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman under the law. Now, how many of you are thinking right now, reading that verse, let's do a little Bible translation here. The fullness of time was come. Now, what was the fullness of time? When did the son become the son? Come on, I've been teaching you now for 30 minutes. When did the son become announced as this is now the Christ? Oh, yeah. See, most of us think, well, that was whenever, you know, the 4,000 years from Abraham and the 4,000 years and the 5,000. We're so great on our historical study that we just miss little simple things like this. When did God announce this is my son? For all to see. That's when he'd gone through the process. Everything Jesus did, he announced... I do nothing without the confirmation of the Father. Oh. Made under the law, verse 5. To redeem, to show them how, to give them authority back, to give them understanding of what their life can look like as a mature believer, man or woman, that we might receive what? Here we go. The witness of the Father. You may not hear him say, this is my son, this is my daughter. But what you will is you'll witness the anointing. Not just fancy preaching, not just fancy words. You'll see some action. Oh. That's how God announces today. See, for Jesus, he said, look, now you know the Christ. For us, it's now you know the Christian. Verse 6, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, who's your daddy? Do you understand how confusing it is in the church world today? We all call him father, we all call him Lord, we all call him those things, but are we that mature that we realize It should be something that stirs us to want to mature to grow. It should be that example that says, man, this is amazing. I mean, it's the dream of God that every one of us know our daddy. Why? Because I remember daddy was always the one that I'd go home to. Come on now. Whenever I had a problem, had a situation, come on. Now. He wasn't just my father. Some of us didn't have really good fathers and God said, that doesn't stop me from wanting to be your daddy. I'm going to leave your name and tell him, who's your daddy? See, when I have awareness of the spirit of his son, there is no weapon, there is no foe, there is no enemy, there is no condition, there is no circumstance, there is no barrier, there is nothing. Why? Because I know my daddy. And I saw my brother in the scriptures of the gospels and the teachings of the apostles And I saw what daddy did to them. And they just reached that point of maturity where God could trust them and say, now this is one of mine. Now you understand a child is one of his. How many of you understand that? But nobody really knows it other than we just go out there and we want to hand out tracts and we want to say good things and and all that. And that's what the world is seeing. They're going, I don't want to go there. What's going to make the world stand up and take notice when the sons of God, the daughters of God, And when they speak in Walmart or on their job, come on now, something happens. Why? Because daddy's there too. (laughs) In conclusion, there's a way that a son lives. It's covenant life. It's understanding the value of daddy and what his plan is. Go to Proverbs chapter 3, and we'll go through those in a moment. Bring up verse 5. This is in closing. Jamie, you come on back up here. See, this is, the, this is let, me, let me just describe it this way. <clears throat> when we begin to, to bring that 
that becomes important to us where I want to be led. I want to be one of those many. I, I don't want to miss it. You understand? I, 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 it's very important for me to, to not miss it. Amen? But I have. And, and that just bugs me. You can ask Jody. I mean, d- does it bug me when I miss it? <laughs> I feel responsible. You understand? And I am. If I'm going to put God's name on it, something needs to happen, bless God. Come on now. If I'm speaking on behalf of him, then something needs to take place. But we work through rebellion, seduction. We work through all this, this mishmash stuff that goes on in the body of Christ today. And I'm not bashing it. I'm a part of that body, man. I want it to be right. I want everybody to be right. I want it to, I want it to be. I really do. But there's a way that a mature believer lives. They understand right and wrong. It says that in the first few verses. They understand that they need wisdom. But let me ask you a question. If, if you know, last week we used the example of Monet, the artist, and, and how he went from detailed paintings to abstract because that's what the people wanted. They wanted to put their own twist. This is what I think it is. This is what I think God is. And, and so while the scripture hadn't changed, the picture and the model hadn't changed. But, you know, I mean, but it doesn't really mean that. You know, we take the detail out and say, well, you know, what do you think it means? Because we're intelligent beings. We're believers. We're Christians. Don't de-Christianize somebody. But what happened if, you know, like Monet, that's why he sold out. That's why he quit painting with such immaculate detail because it wasn't what the people wanted. So, you know, if you want to have a fan club and you want them to buy your paintings, well, you got to give them what they want. Well, the church sold out to that idea. Yeah. And so, you know, the word doesn't mean what the word says anymore. So why do we even have a Bible? Let's just listen to the preacher. Oh, yeah, Lord, help us, brother. And he'll, he'll give us everything we need. I don't need to study it during the week. You know, I don't need to spend it. You know, I just go to church on Sunday and possibly, if nothing else comes in the way on Wednesday. But that's tradition. We don't, we don't need that much, you know. Although the Bible says that in the last days there's going to be a dearth, a lack of hearing the word of God. Hmm. That doesn't scare us any. We just, you know, we're, we're, I've got my Bible college degree. Got all I need. Man, without the spirit of God, you ain't got nothing. Come on now. Now, if you have a map, let me just, let me, instead of a painting, let's talk about a map. Now, if you want to get from where you are to what you need from God, just like if you were wanting to go from here to, let me ask you this. How many of you, and I know this is, not, this is a risk because there's going to be somebody here I know that's going to know how to do this. But how many of you could get from here to Saskatchewan, I think, however you say it, Canada without a map? I knew you was going to do that, bro. I knew there was going to be one. I knew it. I knew it. You didn't want to say, go ahead, man. Tell them I know how to get there. Now, you, you don't, you're not included in this. Anybody else know how to get from here to Ken? Okay. Where don't you know how to get to on the world, man? I mean, you know. <laughs> For the rest of us, this illustration will work. Bear with me, brother. Yeah. If you had a map and you were going to try to find a place without a map and they just said, well, it's up there. You wouldn't know what was along the way, would you? If you had a map, let's say they gave you a map and, it had, and man, it's all blurred out. That's the only map you got. And it's all, it's all, you can't even tell what's on it anymore. I mean, you just, you know, the roads, I mean, you can't tell where the roads are. It's just, it's just a, a kind of an outline of the shape of the United States and Canada. And I want to go up here somewhere. And so you just get on your way. You could possibly arrive there maybe. Everybody but you. But, like, but, but let's just say that map now, it, it's not clear. It's just subjective. You know, well, and then you start going and somebody's going to go and, and we're going now. All of a sudden, you got to make decisions along the way. And it's like, well, I think we need to go this way. Well, I think we need to go that way. Well, there's a mountain right there, man. But if you had a map that was clearly defined, that's been laid out around the obstacles. Come on now. Right? And all the things are clear. Somebody's paved the way. See, if I want to get from poor health to good health and I've got the map, you understand? It's clear. 
There's no subjectivity to it. It's very spelled out. By his stripes, you were healed. Come on now. So at that moment now, I've got the map. I mean, I've, I can get from sickness to well. If I have need of a, of a, of a need if physically, you know, by God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory. Very well spelled out. I mean, does God mean what he said? Can I actually experience that? Then what must I do? Follow the map. What God is trying to do, I believe, in our generation is put some clarity on the map. It's been drawn on so many times. We're not quite sure where the roads lead. The Bible says this, but I'm not sure. But this is the process of of that spirit of adoption for us. The first thing is, if you want to go the right way and arrive to that place where God can use that witness in your life, you got to learn to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Everybody say, got to learn to trust. That's an important word. Not trust in myself or my own will. Not guess. Come on, there's so many people. How many of you understand that you will trust in yourself before you trust in God? You'll trust in somebody you know before you trust in God. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, you will choose your own will over God's will and try to make it God's will every time. Every time. Trust in the Lord. Now that word, Lord, notice it's all capitalized. Remember, we've taught you what that means. That's one of the redemptive names of God. That one is Jehovah Rohi. The Lord is my shepherd. Remember, I'm being led by the Spirit. Nobody can see. Brother Oral Roberts, before he died, Jody and I had the privilege of being mentored by him. A man that was wise in his years, had learned a lot about the church world. I'll never forget when he told us one day, he said, he said, when you heard from God, confer not with flesh and blood, because flesh and blood will try to lead you away from God. You understand? Now, you got to be mature to be in that place. He said, you need to get to the place where you know the spirit of the, of the Lord's voice. You know. You're not guessing. You're not looking for open doors and closed doors. You're not going by your feelings. You're not being impatient. You're going according to God's plan. You're patient. Your process, your learning. Come on, somebody. You trust in Jehovah Rohi to lead me. He makes the map clear. And the second thing is lean not onto your own understanding. Here's where you have to renew your mind. How many of you understand? How many of you have ever been through something that you just couldn't understand? Why God would let you have to go through that? You know it's not of God, but you're trying to figure it out. How many of you have ever done that? Boy, that will mess you up being led by the Spirit more than anything else. Well, I understand. Now, you can be thoroughly convinced that you think you've heard from God, but you'll know very soon. (laughs) Why? Because when God leads you, the road goes around obstacles. It goes around pitfalls. He's built bridges where the enemies put (laughs) pitfalls. Verse 6. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. What does that mean? Not super spiritual. It's like, Father God, I've got a decision to make here, Lord, and I need to acknowledge you. I want to have your guidance. I need to have, in my heart of hearts, I need that peace that passes all my understanding. I need to acknowledge you, Father God. This is a big decision. You understand? That's the third thing you've got to learn to do to go through the process of adoption. And he shall direct thy path. Now, do you think that God's path is going to be just struggle and hardship and hateful and yet we accuse him of that? Verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Respect the Lord. Honor him. Reverence him and depart from evil. You understand, how many times do we hear somebody, you know they're going headlong into evil and and bad, bad situation, but yet, oh, it's God. You know what the devil does? He'll put springs on your wagon and make you think that the ride's going to be smooth. He's a master at doing it when he misleads you and convince you that that's the way God's taking you. Oh, my goodness. Come on now. We need to get past that. Verse 8. It shall be health your navel and the very core of your being physically the marrow of your bones 
One more verse, please. Honor the Lord. Hear the Lord, Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider, so I honor him with the first fruits of all my substance. Everything that increases me. You understand, that's when God can trust you. And I'm going to stop right there for sake of time. We'll pick it up here next week. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. Come on, stand up on your feet. See, this is the instruction of Daddy. So when you say, you know, who's my daddy? It's going to line up with these things. And God will bear witness to it. There's a generation out there screaming to see people live the dream. Remember our, our scripture that God gave us to present this vision to our church was Psalm 126 verse 1. And when the Lord turned the captivity of Zion again, it says, we were like them that dream. We became what others can only dream about. It seems like right now that the world is the only way to prosper. The world is the only way to overcome. The world is the only way to get well. The world is the only way. Come on now. How many of you know that God is bigger than all that? What God is going to do is he needs some men and women to be led by the Spirit of God. He needs some pioneers in a generation that's lost their way. He needs some people who are willing to pay the price to say, you know, I want to be one of the many. Come on now. You understand when he said, for as many as are led by the Spirit, there was no designated number. He said, whoever will, it's our choice. And God says, in doing so, my relationship with you is going to be daddy.